so much happening behind the scenes that nobody sees. It's not really in the eye. And if you're not paying attention or looking for it, it's really easy to just neglect all of those signs and focus on what we've been told to focus on, which is go to work or go to school so you can get a good job and make money and, and get in the system and just be a cog in the wheel, contribute to this disgusting machine that we're you know involved in rather than understanding what's happening. Yeah, <laughs> you pretty much said it right there. I mean, the the deep level red pill for me is the fact that basically everything we were taught to take for granted is just like fundamental information about reality and where we are and who and what we are pretty much all inverted. I mean, I keep turning over rocks and finding out that, oh my gosh, even this thing, it was complete opposite of truth. <laughs> and so yeah. whenever you get to a point with something like government where the lies are so consistent that you can say certainly that what this is is a liar or who this is is a liar. Yeah. Um, why give any more benefit of the doubt at all? <laughs> Just throw it all out and start over. You'll actually be, I think there's a great quote and it slips my mind who actually said this first, but whoever you are, shout out you. The quote is that in this particular age, true literacy isn't measured by a person's ability to read or write. It is in the ability to unlearn what they thought they knew and <laughs> relearn something different or closer to truth or hopefully wow. actually true. I like that. Yeah, I really like that, that quote. It's good for I, the I mean, personally, <clears throat> sorry, dude, I hate this format. It's so easy to step on each other. No, uh, it's okay. Pers personally, I came from a world, um, I mean, I was, I grew up in California, joined the Marine Corps out of high school, was very brainwashed, very, I mean, every Marine is brainwashed during the process that's part of boot camp is to tear you down and make you nothing and then they teach you what's important and teach you how to be you know desensitized to whatnot but anyway i came from that world where i was very uh conservative very right wing you know I, I would say i would fall under that that box at the time and as i've grown as i've understood more about what's going on and what's important I'm now only I only have like memories of what that was, and now I'm I couldn't be further from that. I think it's important for people to help each other, and you know, universal income and uh, universal basic income and healthcare and all those things are important. And why can't we do that? Because capitalism, because you didn't work as hard. You know what I mean? It just I couldn't. I I, I kind of have one foot in each camp now, which is a really interesting way to be moving about this reality that we're all sharing seeing the woo and seeing the people that are you know out of that yeah and it totally makes sense um the real truth is that both the liberal side of things has some things right and the conservative side of ourselves has some well, absolutely. things right the but the thing that neither side has right in a two-party system of government is the realization that humans don't need government and right. that's a that's a big one now, there's such a thing as social harmony and even rules that can exist without government. But government, see, the, the masters that created the language that we use today long ago knew what they were doing when they gave us certain talismanic words that we charge with mythical powers. And for many people, especially atheist people, government is no different than what basically must be God. It's this, it's this character, a fictional idea. It's a thought form that... <laughs> A bunch of people believe in and because everyone believes in it essentially its powers are, are allowed to exist in the world but if nobody believed in it anymore it would be as non uh, physical as any other you know someone made up their own god and no one else knows about it so how could that god have any power over those people that don't even know that it exists and so really what why i brought up the fact that the controllers made the language that we use a long time ago is because as soon as you start studying etymology and start on your own without even needing to look things up, just start to think about what the sounds of a word mean, then you get a better idea of what the symbol is actually representing. Now, the symbols can represent more than one thing. They can represent one thing to one person, another thing to other people. That's why you have multiple definitions of a word in a dictionary. But uh, just the definitions themselves aren't the only thing that a word can mean that are in the official dictionary. dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, right. before I talk about government anymore, let's talk about the word dictionary. It's the diction, which is like the mandate 
of Ares, which is the god of war. So you look up the things that are supposed to be the true meaning of words in the god of war's book. <laughs> That's a little <laughs> odd, isn't it? I mean, Ares is Mars. I am Ares. So Ares isn't necessarily a negative symbol, that, that word in and of itself, because actually in another manner of speaking, Ares represents in the occult sciences, the cere cerebellum, the very top of the head, the connection of, with the being to the creator or even the creator's uh, living presence in the being. So <laughs> Aries in that sense no longer means God of war. It means the creator in man. In a, so it's a very super spiritualized word. So is the dictionary you're using the diction of Aries or the diction of the creator, the, di the diction of the, the, the Ram of God or the God of war? <laughs> <laughs> and just that alone is a big, big leap for a lot of people who are completely trapped in an only left brain way of looking at the reality. And the left brain is the thing that slices stuff up into compartments. It's actually the part of your brain that gets really programmed when you go through boot camp because they put you through such bad experiences that this element of yourself that is all about dividing things up and putting them into categories and giving them labels and it's the conscious part of the mind as opposed to the right brain being the unconscious part of the mind. So it's the part that you're focusing on. And because it's the part that you're focusing on, it has the power to not look at things as much as it has the power to look at things. And so it puts certain things away, hides them in the subconscious or makes a barrier between itself and that part of the knowledge that it actually has, but it's just ignoring in the subconscious. And in boot camp, for example, you're put through stuff like hell week where the physical training is essentially torture, not to mention, I'm sure there's psychological elements to the experience of boot camp that could resemble torture, definitely, or programming. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so in this process, it actually, your psyche automatically, and it's a, it's a defense mechanism, it's built into the reality on purpose, so you don't just completely lose it in a bad situation. It compartmentalizes or fragments itself. It puts little pieces of memories and feelings and things that are part of you but that you need to reject in order to survive or to save face or to exist in whatever paradigm you're in it hides those away in little compartments and uh, you don't look at them anymore and they actually take energy to keep them stored there and just in the same way it keeps it takes energy to hide things from yourself just as basic as what the word government really means so now to bring it all back full circle <laughs> I, hopefully someone's already out there thought about what does government mean <laughs> And if you take the two words, it's govern and meant. Govern means control or rule, and meant is the mind, the mental. So you tell me, is government mind control, or is it a mythical organization of people that has powers that are invested in it that a normal individual does not have by natural law? <laughs> and that's essentially what it is. And it actually takes people a great deal of energy just to ignore the fact that they are enslaved to the god of government and that government is the religion and there was no separation of state and religion like America was promised to be. It's just like the Roman Empire where Pontifus Maximus was the also the emperor for a time. And you have the complete merger of the state with the religion. And uh, people are blind to that because they compartmentalize that fact out of their reality tunnel so that they can function without feeling like, oh shit, I'm a slave or oh shit, I'm going crazy. <laughs> oh shit, I can't function around the people that are all still thinking this way. So I have to keep that in the box. Keep, and everybody's stuffing that down in the box. And everybody has their mind, their psyche fragmented in a way that is uh, highly, highly chopped up and compartmentalized. And then when you look at society <laughs> on a big scale, you have the same thing happening with religious organizations and hierarchies, with the government itself and with corporations in that the person at this rung of the ladder doesn't know what the person over here is doing. And right. the, the person who's the president has has the top secret intel that the, the peons at the bottom don't have any clue about. So that's compartmentalization as well. And the universe being a fractal, it, it, everything is uh, self-similar across scales. And in a sense, that's what we see with any mass organization of humanity is that it has a resemblance to the human psyche and the way that the human psyche structures itself. So the way out of being completely drained by all this compartmentalization of ourselves that we do because of trauma essentially and that all of us have done because it's a trauma based culture that comes in through even the most basic stuff like you see someone get uh, shot and it's all bloody on a tv show that's just supposed to be fiction and you're just like well i'm only watching this for entertainment so it's not really bothering me but 
there's actually a part of you that's like an animal part of yourself, like a deep down part of yourself where this thing called mirror neurons go on. And a part of you is like absorbing the energy of that brutal murder as if it was a real thing. And maybe that's like a minor trauma over time, but you keep building that up. And the thing that you thought was resilience and, oh, uh, I'm just not affected. I'm not sensitive to tell the blood and gore in the horror movies is actually something that you've built up an energetic barrier inside yourself to make sure, sure you don't feel it. So the way back is to generate more sensitivity to the way that you feel about things. If you can start from that level and keep asking yourself, what do I feel? And even like try to tune in with your body about that. That's actually the first step to being able to tell truth from lies just automatically like that, like spider sense. And it's a, it's something you got to work on and develop. It takes mindfulness practices and skills like that. Because like I said, most people are really caught in the left brain side of things, which is also the masculine. Why you see a, a pseudo patriarchal dominance in the world, even to this day. And, and we'll come back around to like ideas of universal basic income and solutions to the, the, the idea of government, because I, uh, we, we have a lot of places to go, but I think maybe it'd be a good time to pass the mic back over to you for a second and see what you're thinking at this point, as far as, as far as what I've been going on about, uh, because <laughs> I know I can give some more solutions about what it takes to balance the left and right sides of the brain. I could talk about the role of the body in this in more depth and, and why that is actually super critical and important and why this entire journey to learning the truth about what's going on in the external will never make any progress until you get to the point of making the progress of learning the truth about yourself as a physical being in your physical body. And actually one goes with the other and you can't have one without the other. And that's a big secret that even most people who study conspiracy couldn't tell you that. And they actually spin their wheels and feel like they're going crazy and uh, they don't bring solutions to the table. They just in, inadvertently spread fear and doom and gloom where they might be talking about stuff that's true, but like, where's your solutions, bro? And it's all inside and it's all in the way that you care for yourself uh, on a, a physical level. Like, are you a good parent to the child that is your body? Like you're a grown up now. That means that you have to be the grown up. That means that the body, you, you have to be in charge of it. You got to say, go to bed at the right time. You got to say, brush your teeth. I mean, it's gross, but I forget to brush my teeth all the time. I'm still working on really basic stuff, but that's where I think the deepest level of solutions are at, but we can go anywhere from, from here, man. Yeah, definitely, man. We covered a lot of stuff right there. <laughs> um, so, so one of the things about this podcast, and I don't, I like that we did a rolling start. I've been wanting to do that for a while, so we're just going to keep it moving. Yeah. Um, so one of the things about this podcast, uh, for me, one of my intentions is to kind of bridge since I, I do have one foot firmly in both sides of like, I'm new, but learning and understanding about a lot of aspects to this reality that I didn't believe were real or dismissed as, you know, nonsense. Um, and, and I'm open to understanding more. I'm not saying, you know, again, I'm, I have a foot in both camps. And, um, one of the things that I really want to do is to make it easier for other people to consume these types of ideas. Um, and you went through a lot of things and I think we went really fast. And I think that certain people who have no experience, uh, you know, digging into these things might not put all the things together. So I kind of want to, as best as my memory will allow, kind of, you know, dissect each one a little bit and, and help link everything together for people that weren't, you know, potentially keeping up. So uh, one thing that you touched on was the things that you're consuming, the things that you're watching, the things that you're listening to and how that can have an effect. A friend of mine who's been on the podcast, Joshua Upshaw, I'm not sure if you're familiar with who that is, but I think we we're, were Facebook friends. Yeah. He's a really cool dude, a good friend of mine. Uh, but we were talking the other day about um, rap music and how really when you listen to it, if you listen to the content for the last at least 10 years, I'd, I'd argue longer, there's really nothing positive. There's nothing uplifting. There's nothing resilient. It's just material, material, money, uh, cars, all of these things, treating people poorly, uh, especially women, uh, depicting that it's you know a good thing for men to impregnate women and just leave rather than staying and raising those kids like that's uh something they've perpetuated with this music and and we started talking about well how does that happen and 
Um, a friend of mine argued or made the point that it started with NWA um, in, in the rap community, and that's when things started going downhill. But I feel like, um, since we're going on tangents here, Tupac, growing up in Los Angeles, Tupac was uh, a beacon of hope for a lot of people. He he preached um, when, when he first came out, when he was a young rapper coming out of um, California. He he was talking about treating women with respect and that it's a woman's right to choose what she does with that baby, whether you're involved or not talking about like he was advocating for keeping money in the ghetto. And when you do make it, don't run and leave and take your money with you. Cause that's not going to help the people that you came up with. And he had all these really good ideas of community. And while he was obviously rapping about being a thug, he was still trying to preach positivity and keep things I feel like going in a better direction. And then the whole snafu happened where he ended up with the East versus West thing. He, um, God, I'm going to get really deep in this rabbit hole. Um, he, um, are you familiar with, with t- the Tupac story? Do I, do I need to go into it? To, a, to a degree, I'm familiar with his individual story and the hardcore truth about the music industry itself and rap music or, if you change the way that you look at the A in that word, you could say rape music. Right. That is, it is not a cultural phenomenon that you can look at the African American community and blame the way that that music is on them. What you're looking right. at is packaged, a packaged and delivered message from corporations that right. are exactly. no different than the corporations that own the mainstream media outlets of today. And that's exactly character- what we were. Sorry, that's exactly what we were talking about. That that's the the short end of the story was the way that that happens is way back when music started, back when like Elvis was stealing black people's music and singing it for himself. The reason that that happened was white people owned the, they controlled the industry and they get to de- when that happens, you get to decide whose music gets played. When you own the, the media companies and you own the record labels, which eventually that perpetuated. And they said, okay, black people, you can sing your music, but we're going to choose what music you get to sing. And they did it very carefully and very selectively where they would only allow people who were, you know, uh, perpetuating the idea of money, cars and hoes or whatever, not, you know, that's what you're looking at is gatekeepers. Right, there are gatekeepers exactly. in all forms of mass media. Gatekeepers exist, and the truth about them is that they are parts. Of, they are they make up a larger network of various secret societies interested in deeply occult stuff that most people would have a difficult time even believing go on in those circles. And the artists that are brought into, brought through the gate and allowed to become stars, if you will, celebrities. There's there's so much to this, but I'll just try to keep it brief so that we can hopefully touch on as many tangents as possible and maybe direct I can maybe direct people who are really curious about this to go further. And, you know, I'll answer questions to the best of my ability, too. But each each era, each next generation of music that hit had a specific intention behind it, including the type of racial tensions that we have now between white people and black people. It's all manufactured by and through culture through the gatekeepers that own the means of production within the culture. And so while it may be true that a lot of people have been brainwashed to be racist against each other, actually humans aren't naturally racist. And actually most people aren't racist. And no type of mainstream music, especially rap music, actually represents the a true slice of humanity. It's fabricated, it's artificial, and it's there to divide. And it does a really good job of that. I think of all the types of music that have been weaponized in that way, from rock and roll to rap music, rap has been the most ridiculous. And they even create icons or messiah figures like Tupac. And then they go through in a very occult and ritualistic way, the process of sacrificing that icon. And there's a reality to this. I mean, you've heard of the 27 Club. Everybody knows some weird stories about certain musical celebrities that have died in in odd ways, but it's usually few people have a lot of the picture put together. And a person that I would direct everyone to is an author, and he's also a podcaster, although I can't remember the name of his show, but it's a guy named Mark Devlin from the UK, D-E-V-L-I-N. 
He's not the first person to have done this type of research, but he has a couple of books called Musical Truth and Musical Truth 2, where he tracks the involvement of secret societies and the, the rich families uh, that have been the aristocracy behind the scenes of the United States for many, many decades. He demonstrates their involvement and also government agencies like the CIA being involved with everything from Elvis to the Grateful Dead and the, the rise of the hippie movement and the tune-in dropout type of culture of the psychedelic revolution. All this stuff is manufactured and staged in waves to have the desired cause and effect outcome. And even in the case of things that we perceive to be countercultural, it's actually what you would call controlled opposition. And that that's why the hippies were protesting against war. And that was actually incited. And it's about because they know that it doesn't matter how many hippies go out and protest the war in Vietnam. It's going to happen because they don't get to decide what happens. The people don't decide what happens. And what it does is the half of the country that's like so brainwashed that they think it's a great idea to go be at war in Vietnam. And I'll even send my own kid. They are now pissed off at all the hippies that are protesting. And you have division, division. And it's always been the game plan of masters against slaves to divide and conquer across as many different axes as possible, whether it's white, black, gay, straight, um, you know, old, young, male, female, like rap music, don't like rap music, anti-war, pro-war, abortion, anti-abortion. Yeah, red many, versus blue. <laughs> that's all the, of it. Well, red versus blue is symbolic deeply of the left brain and the right brain. And in a masculine and feminine sense, that's what the red and the blue represent in, in occultism. And occultism, I use that word a couple of times, it freaks people out that are not very knowledgeable in it just to hear that word because it's had a spell in a sense cast on it through mm -hmm. the definition, the diction of Aries that most people have of occult meaning evil. In fact, the literal meaning of the word occult is hidden. So when I talk about anything being occult or occulted, it is something that is generally hidden in the background, but it is something to be found if you go looking for it. And it's been done with a lot of words. They've been, they've had e egregores, if you will, uh, thought forms attached to them that have a, a serious energy and weight that people feel in their bodies when they say it. Like if I, I say anarchy to the wrong person, they think I'm talking about chaos and burning down all the all the people's businesses like we just saw happen. But in the actual definition of the word, that one means no masters, which literally means no slaves. Anarchy is an, which is without, and archi, which is from archon in Greek, which r really means rulers or masters. So just in that, there's another perfect example. Like I'll go into words all day because that's where the real deep truth is about how much cognitive dissonance we have psychologically between our reality and the truth of our reality. And yeah, anarchy does not mean chaos. It does not mean evil. It doesn't mean no rules. It means no masters, which also therefore would mean no slaves. So when well, I think it we comes see language used against us all the time, it's being used against us now. We're, it's one of the biggest reasons we're divided in 2020 is what are you allowed to say? What's what's allowed? What words are good and what words are bad when words we've all made them up like they're just sounds you make with your mouth. It's your intention. It's what you feel not the the words that you happen to use that are good or bad but they've weaponized and made a war on words to further divide the people as well yeah you nailed it and i mean just saying the wrong words on youtube will mean that the algorithms will keep your shows from getting reached by as many people so be careful i might be one of those people who get you in trouble but, right i'm sure um, this one this one is going to be hidden there's no way that youtube is going to want any of the things that we're talking about to be big but uh, yeah, like I said, they just That's deleted okay. the antics of Press for Truth. Oh, I think I said that on my show. I was just recording something for my show right before this, but a guy has a channel. <laughs> I did since, see that. I did yeah, see 14 that. 14 years, Press for Truth, gone. And he should not have been deleted. I mean, that's crazy. And it's it's tyranny. So we talked about one thing I want to talk about. This is a really good segue for is censorship in the mainstream media. And nowadays, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, that's all mainstream media anymore. Um, what what's going on with that and what alternatives do people have like i feel like for me definitely i hate being on facebook personally it, it drives me crazy the algorithms really push that hate and divide and when you post something that's constructive or positive your mom is the only one that sees it <laughs> right exactly or other people that feel like us who are like oh good finally something you know a beacon of, of positivity on this dumpster fire of a 
platform. But what else is there? It feels like that's it. Like it feels like um, there really isn't a legitimate alternative in the same way that what alternative do you have to Amazon or Walmart? Like there really isn't something equivalent, at least that's being advertised as equivalent. I'm sure there is. And I hope that you might have some insight for people who are feeling the same way that we're feeling and want different options in their life to be able to interact with other people in a more positive or less toxic way. There are solutions. And, you know, let me just go through a few off the top of my head. First of all, it's a great idea to start to jump ship on YouTube. And if a lot of people did that in mass, it would definitely send a message that, hey, guess what? You're, you're boiling the frogs too fast and they're jumping out of the pan. So right. that's a... It, <laughs> so where do you go if you leave YouTube? I know of a couple sites, but I guarantee there's several more than what I've got. Uh, and I also say BitChute is a good one. Uh, B-I-T-C-H-U-T-E. And that's decentralized. No one can come in and delete your videos because they're stored on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Also, it's bitch shoot like B I T C H like female dog and then shoot or B I T and then shoot. It's bit shoot, <laughs> and I think the <laughs> creators are like possibly not from the United States and maybe didn't realize how funny that is because it does have the word bitch in it. And I never I look at words all the time and I never even made that connection. <laughs> but I've got a bit shoot bit shoot channel. <laughs> I don't know, but that's hilarious. It works. It's not a lot of people in a sense like YouTube's got most of the world on it. And this is just one solution. And there's another one called DTube, which is connected to the Steemit blockchain, which uh, gives you some cryptocurrency for using it, which is kind of cool. And uh, another one that it's, I believe it's pronounced library, but uh, let me look this up real quick, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, no worries. I know that I have the program installed. It's just spelled a little funky. It's another one that's a really good decentralized program. L-B-R-Y. So it's like library without vowels. Those are right. three video platforms that you can go for. The thing is, we got to be prepared for one of two futures. The future where all information is controlled from a central point and we're all on the same network and platform, but we have massive censorship and uh, loss of freedoms in many other ways and constant propaganda being dumped down our throat. The other option is that we decentralize and we spread out and go to a lot of different networks. That way, even if the powers that should not be swoop in and like buy one of these video platforms, well, they only have 10% of the market share or, or less, a small fraction of the percent, and they can't just easily monopolize everything all at once because that's exactly what happened with YouTube. It was... I mean, you can look into the development of YouTube. It was not just like some, just like Facebook. None of these things just came out of some tech genius that made it up out of thin air and just happened to make it big. It's all government. It's all always been government. That's a conversation for another day, but you know, it, you can look into it and you'll find something. There's definitely a there there. <laughs> and getting off of these centralized platforms means that we also, uh, you know, there's actually an impetus to compete, to have a better platform, to improve it. You know, it's not the monopolized one. And that's kind of cool too. And there's many other reasons why decentralization is one of the most significant solutions of our age. And it applies to pretty much every area of our life that we want to break free of tyranny and retake up the mantle of personal responsibility. Uh, as far as social media style sites, there's a lot of those around. And I won't make any particular endorsements, to be honest, uh, because the way that it's kind of worked is different subgroups of people with certain political opinions will all kind of congregate on one alternate platform right. or another. And then it's like, this is the Nazi one. <laughs> it, it gave you free speech, but everyone here is Nazis. <laughs> like, there's, <laughs> there's stuff like that. But uh, what I think what's been really exciting to me is that I've got a discord channel for my podcast interverse and there's a link to it on my website and it's not a huge group at the moment. It was nice. I don't have to really moderate much, but it's a, a little Island of people that are kind to each other and ask questions and share information. And while you're there having the conversations that you're seeking to have on purpose, you are not distracted by all the crazy garbage that would be there on a mainstream social media site, pulling you away from whatever it is that you came there to talk about in the first place. So think of it as 
you know, there's no, there's not a lot to scroll through. So it's not something you're going to want if you really like to just stare at your phone and scroll right. through a bunch of meaningless crap. Uh, it's going to be like a targeted self-directed experience. You're either going to share something from your heart or you're going to ask a question that you really hope to be answered. At least that's kind of how it's been on my discord. I know that probably other discord channels have been maybe more chaotic depending on who's you're looking at, but that's the type of thing. It's like little cells of, of independent thinking and non-centralized, non-controlled stuff. And discord, what I think is fun about it is uh, some people point out like, Hey, discord means disharmony, lack of agreement, but it also could mean discord as in disentangle or break free from a bond or bondage, cut the cord. So uh, all of these words have many meanings depending on the angle that you look at them and no symbol, no word, no number, nothing is actually evil in and of itself. It's how it's used, how you interpret it, but also the intention of the person behind it. But it's useful to know all the angles and see things from 360 degrees instead of our normal cut in half 180 perspective. Uh, because by doing that, then you can know like which is the one, which one of these meanings is the one that I mean, which is the one, like maybe I just need a whole different word because so many other meanings are attached to this that other people aren't gonna understand. That's why I'm kind of careful about talking about anarchy as much as I love the concept and could just, I could give the philosophical reasons why it's the only path forward for an enlightened civilization period. But just the word is so talismanic, people will get really uh, triggered just by hearing it. So uh, right. I focus as much as I can on the, the solutions that involve healing the body and healing the, the emotional and energy body as well. Because uh, as I was kind of getting at, all the other pieces of the puzzle actually fall in place when you do that. And if you don't, then whatever you go out looking for in the external is going to return the same type of distortion, dissonance, and disharmony as what it's going to reflect back to you where your disharmony is. But because you're out of whack and you don't have your full level of consciousness, your full amount of energy to bear on whatever it is that you're looking at externally, you'll just be confused by it. It'll just be more confusion, add to the confusion, add to the noise. So always remember the, the path to getting a grip on any of what's happening in the reality is always starting on the journey of healing yourself to the best of your ability, being honest with yourself as much as possible, and uh, take continuing on that path forward and letting the other things synchronistically come to you as they will. I think that's a, a big secret that's not very, really not very talked about, and there's so much more we could get into with that notion. I think that's really, really the truthful place where the the solutions are is in our health. Our health is our wealth too. <laughs> I mean, to get back to the universal income thing, let me just say about that. Uh, first of all, who's got the control of the money pipe? They turn it on and off. Why are they gonna turn it on and off? Also, what is that money? Is it actually something of value or is it a fake fiat currency that is actually representing debt? So do you want someone giving you a universal basic debt? That's what they're giving you. And the more that they give out, the more inflated the debt becomes and the less valuable the debt is to the people who are playing Monopoly with it. And there's, I mean, there's so many problems with the notion. And so I agree. Hold on. Okay, Sorry. Go ahead. I, ag I agree with you in that sentiment. But what else is there? Like, I, I, I this is what something I struggle with. I agree that money is a construct that we created right? We wanted to make it easier to, to exchange things. At least that's the premise of why we have money to make things simpler. I do this, you do that. How are we going to equate what things are worth, blah, blah, blah. So what do we do when we have a society of this size with all of these things that intertwine with the idea of money? What do you do? Do you, you, do you have to dismantle everything completely and like reframe what the heck we're doing here or is there legitimately a way to effectively transfer us from the the system that we're in now where most people are i would argue slaves to money most people equate their passion and what they're supposed to be doing and their their purpose not passion their purpose a lot of people their purpose is money well i have to amass wealth so that i can have things so that blah 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 but that's as far as they go. And that's what they're working toward is amassing money, which is something we created that you don't need. So what else is there though? What, what can we do if we don't want to continue on that cycle when we have so many things that rely on it? Man, I'm so glad you asked this question. 
<laughs> I'm going to go in on this pretty hard. Let's go. I, I was I'm really feeling it. Uh, so first of all, back to the idea that money, it, you said people are slaves to money. Money is their God. Then that's a real, that's a real astute thing. Money is their God. If you ever seen the movie, they live when he puts on the glasses that show him the truth of reality, please go watch it. They live everybody. His amazing movie from 80, 1988. As soon as he looks down at the money, it says, this is your God on the money. And it could not be more accurate. On the back, everyone's probably had to have heard by now that, hey, this thing that everyone has at least a little bit of called a $1 bill, on the back of it has all these weird symbols and a pyramid with the capstone off and an eye above it with a triangle. And what is all this? What is what is going on here? Well, there's a one eye on the back of your money because the money itself is the one eye. Mon, mono, I. Money, Mon eye, it's it's just in the phonetics. Play with the phonetics and it'll show you things. The one eye represents the eye single. And in magical traditions and occultism and many old spiritual traditions, the eye single is actually the third eye or it's the balance, the activated state between the right and left hemispheres of the brain working in unison. So you're, it's also the spirit of the creator in dwelling within the being, literally. It's back to that Aries idea, the cerebellum. It's the the highest level of activation of a conscious being is when their eye, it says in the Bible also, uh, your eye needs to be single, something like that. That's what it's referring to. And the money itself is casting a spell on people to make them think this is the one eye. This is the mon eye. This is our God. It's completely, completely a spell. And that's why they put that symbol on the $1 bill. You'd think, oh, we're proud of our work. Uh, we're we're the secret society. We should put our symbols on the best bill, the hundred dollar bill or whatever. No, man, it's on the one that everybody's got and money's green as well. That's the, representing the heart chakra. That's the, that's where the energy of abundance dwells on the spectrum of colors and the law of correspondences of the universe. So money is debt in our current system. The fake God is debt. And because it's debt, every dollar that's printed, this is a fact comes into existence with a certain amount of debt attached to it that now the government owes to whatever the central bank is that get issued the money. So it's a game of musical chairs because the inflation will continue to increase and there'll never be enough money in the system to supply all the people with a chair, metaphorically speaking. And that's why people are enslaved to money. They're constantly chasing more debt. They buy a house, a mortgage, a mort gauge. Mort means death and gauge in uh, ancient English meant an agreement or a pact, a death pact, your mortgage. You're signing up to give up money that you don't even have, which is debt. So you're, just tr you're signing up for, for debt on debt. <laughs> and debt sounds like death. Debt is dead. It is the death half of the wave of the spectrum. So... <laughs> true money, true wealth is the reason I call money currency is because money is your current. See, it's your current, your charge. You, we spend all of our energy chasing the wealth at the expense of our health. And when we lose that, we have to just discharge the wealth to get attempt to get the health back, which you can't even do to a certain degree. Some things aren't going to come back. You're not going to be young as you were at, at, at any rate. And, you know, if you, really wanted to enjoy your life, you would definitely focus on making the health the baseline, most high priority thing. Now, to really answer the question of like, because that was a lot of foundational stuff about what's wrong with money, but it's not what's wrong with money. It's what's wrong with money that is debt. Now, if you had money that was true current, that was true value, I mean, gold and silver have been used for such a long time because they have actual properties naturally that make them desirable to have and use. If you had something where what you were trading for other things was actually something of value, then the currency that you were trading would have current. It wouldn't be this dead, lifeless thing. It wouldn't be a false god. And because the creator is literally the energy or the current or the electricity of the universe itself as it animates all things in, in this electric universe, something that is, is real current, a real means of exchange, is actually um, the creator in a way. Uh, money in that sense would represent the one eye in a, in a way. I mean, it wouldn't be your God. It would just be a, a channel through which you, your creator 
helped you generate and work with abundance. It's generational wealth, they call it, whenever you have stockpile something like gold or silver, because it doesn't matter what paradigm or monetary system is going on, that will always have value and can be bought into the new system whenever it gets brought online, like kind of looks like it's happening right now. So there's other ways apart from gold and silver to have a type of currency that actually has current. I mean, let me backtrack with one little thing. What's on the sides of a river that has a current? It's the banks. Everything about the system that we're in is related to water and the flow of things because the flow of energy is money is esoterically an energy that flows through our society, but it's stagnant, dead debt money that we're using right now. As, and that's why when you look at a graph of all the countries in the world and which ones are in debt are red, the whole, the whole picture is red. <laughs> How is every country red? How are we all in the red? It's stupid. It's to the banks. Somehow the, the flow is being held in the banks. And there's a lot more to the concept of how maritime laws are actually rule everything in commerce and a lot of uh, tricky word magic or even black magic involved in that. That's another conversation that people could get into. Uh, that's very deep <laughs> in stuff. But it's just w- worth knowing for now that if you were to come up with a system that had some sort of value and uh, Bitcoin and blockchain is not that, I am sorry to say, cryptocurrency is not that because it doesn't have any inherent value. It's ones and zeros in a digital system. But you could come up with a form of cryptocurrency per se that had some tie back to something real in the world. Like uh, <laughs> there's a bad example. There's some Russian cryptocurrency like Sandcoin, I think it's called, where literally uh, the coin is worth an equivalent amount trade-in of sand (laughs) that's not very valuable it's pretty pretty uh, lame but if say i mean you could do this with or without crypto but if you had some kind of system where the notes represented something like an hour of work so like one dollar in this new system meant that i could trade this one dollar in for someone to work for me doing some basic labor or task for an hour and that's a very it's a very simplified example but that's the type of thing that we could easily create where what we're trading around instead of it representing poverty literally representing death and debt it could represent life and the flow and um and helping each other and i mean there's so much we could do it's it's really a lack of imagination at this point that keeps us asking the question of well what would we do without our god i mean without our government i mean without our money it's all one thing and it's all religion and we've all been conditioned through trauma-based mind control, which the controllers are very, very knowledgeable about. And it's not recent. They've known about it for thousands of years, probably. And this is what has been done to humanity repeatedly, traumatized and conditioned, traumatized and conditioned over and over again, compartmentalization, division, splintering. So it's the time now to, to find all the parts of ourselves that we've been divided on internally, all the compartments of our emotions and energy that we need to reintegrate. It's time for radical self-awareness and inner sensitivity. And as crazy as it is in the outside world right now, it's not actually the time to worry about and try to figure out the outside world. We will have these things revealed to us if we pursue our path of wholeness, holistic health for ourselves, improving our current. That's also what's gonna get us out of debt because we will have the actual charge or energy to do something different, to um, to generate, to create generational wealth. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at with these things for this current flow of thinking, and I'll pass it back to you. <laughs> How do you feel about um, the government trying? So when they first, with the first stimulus check that they were going to send for COVID, uh, Pelosi and the dnc was trying to push through um that they would give people stimulus money but it wouldn't be like us dollars it wouldn't be cash it would be a separate currency that would be a more universal potentially single currency it's a digital Um, dollar right and so what what do you think about the fact that there's these magical cash shortages all of a sudden and there's a lot of information coming out at least i haven't witnessed any cash shortages but i also don't use cash all that often um so i don't know that i would notice it but i have seen at least on certain media sites that there is a shortage of cash do you see any connection between 
uh, these supposed cash shortages and the government trying to push us to the digital dollar. And if they do push that through and let's say the next, you know, stimulus, because all the checks are running out in a couple of weeks for most people who are getting pandemic unemployment. So if they do push another stimulus, now that they've already showed that they wanted to do the digital dollar, do you think potentially if they push it through for this second check, what what do you think the 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 ramifications are of that, and what could that be leading toward if that does end up going through and they actually start a digital dollar? Well, the long term plan for this is the same game plan that's been in the works since they put that triangle with the eye in it on the back of the one dollar bill, and it is to inevitably and eventually create a one world government that all that you hear all your conspiracy minded friends talking about a one world control system, a completely centralized control system. I mean, to the nines and the creation of a digital currency is not as convenient as people might think, because there will come a point where the first things that will happen is you can no longer give your granddaughter $20 on her birthday that you put in her card. You have to send it through some sort of app to her digital device and fuck she's eight years old why does she even have a cell phone and like there's all kinds of problems just right there you can't pay a friend for an odd job give him some gas money whatever all your income will eventually be tracked to the level where the next point is it uh you don't have to do your taxes anymore guys guess what we're we're gonna make you stop having to do your own taxes every year aren't you so happy aren't you really thrilled right we'll just take care of it for you yeah, we'll just make sure we measure every in and out of everything that you've ever done at all times and make sure we get exactly how much you owe us. You're so welcome. So that would be like step two. And eventually in the, the later phases of the rollout that's going on right now, it involves replacing human labor and productivity completely with uh, machines. And if basically there'll be the poor people that are on universal basic income, and then there'll be the affluent people that do jobs like creating the propaganda to entertain all the people who are sitting at home because they don't have a job anymore and they're watching Netflix. And there will be a probably an artist in middle class that attempts to make it with their things that like they do now, are, you know, artists and, and builders and things like that. But that'll get a lot harder to do because of the squeeze of things like pandemic panics and uh, things like the fact that uh, people aren't going out to the shows anymore that where they would meet these artists or see them because they're scared and or they need to stay home and wear a mask or whatever. They wear a mask when they're walking in the park. It's it's really pushing in this dehumanizing direction. And I think that the, the point is that eventually we'll see exactly what goes on in China and that, uh, you know, they'll just turn off your ability to ride the bus. They'll turn off your ability to... Get, go out of the country. I mean, that's already been turned off for a lot so of countries. Say they've already done that, right? I mean, they've, you exactly. We, can you even leave the U.S. right now? If if I wanted to go to another country, could I even leave the country right now? Well, my my family, my mom had this trip to Ireland for me and my dad and sister planned for like over a year, and that was going to be in September. And guess what? Not happening. I don't even know if she'll get her money back. Uh, it's it's really crazy, and so this isn't all to be. The airline basically true. said no. I I don't really know. I it had some. I just asked her if we we're going, and she said no. It's not happening. Maybe the travel agency is not arranging it anymore. Maybe you're not allowed to go to England. I didn't really pursue the point. I was just like, all right, lame. But this isn't to be doom and gloom. But the if we don't stand up and talk about this and do like rebel against this, I mean, I don't mean go out in the street and try to fight people, but rebel with the power of the word and with the power of our health, because guess what? The Leviathan sustains itself largely on all the poisons that it sells you. So if you're really focusing on your health and focusing on decentralizing your resource acquisition, getting food from local growers, that way you know where it came from and that they didn't do anything weird to it and they didn't spray it with poison and tell you that it magically got safe to eat when they put it on the grocery store shelves, even though the guy that sprayed it with that poison was wearing the big yellow hazmat suit like Walter White from Breaking Bad. Then magically now that apple's okay to eat and I already have to pay $2 for an organic apple. So it gets me a little heated that we're in the place that we're, we're at where it – uh, where so many people just feel restricted, like they can't do the right thing for their body, even if they know about the, the importance of eating organic or, or their health. And so my advice to people is 
what do exactly what you can as much as you can right now for your health, even if that means that you don't save as much money because you're buying higher quality food. Because A, you will be motivated to find a way to do that more cheaply, possibly from growing your own food or finding friends to do a, a shared garden with, things like that. And that's a healthy activity in and of itself. And B, once you're used to the amount that it costs to um, eat the healthy stuff, you'll adjust your lifestyle in other ways accordingly to make sure that you can keep eating because you've now made the decision that the other stuff isn't food and you're not going to eat it. And it cause we will be a little bit isolated for a while by doing this because at gatherings of people, you're like, you're not drinking the Kool-Aid, you're not eating the McDonald's or whatever that everyone's having, but good on you, man. Think for yourself. <laughs> It's really important that your body is getting uh, not poisoned and eating healthy, healthy, real food and not stuff out of a box. And so once you have that level of adjustment, then going forward for the rest of your life, that's just what you're used to. That's the level that your current is at. So your currency will reflect that you'll have a better capacity to generate wealth for yourself because your health is the generator. And that's the real secret. The money is a symbol of your personal energy. And everything in the reality is symbolical like that everything in the reality is mental in nature at the base of things so get used to doing what it takes for your health as soon as you can and let the rest of the pieces fall into place as they will but trust me on this one trust completely trust me on this one if there's anything that you take my word for everything else i'd rather you just go look into it and i would love for you to go look into why you need to eat organic food and not pesticide covered gmo stuff but I, if you don't, just please take my word for it. It's really worth it because in the future, as the potential cost of those things might go up for people that are still in the system of things, uh, you're going to need to have already set a precedent for yourself that that's what you expect. And that's going to also be a motivator for you to do what it takes, no matter what, to achieve that. And it's also going to set an example for other people. If it's just, if it comes to the point that you're part of producing and not just consuming, which 99% of what we do is consume. And so maybe we should find some balance there. Then other people can benefit off of that productivity that you've got too. And it's contagious. So just know that, that it's, it's a lie that you can't afford it. Um, find a way, change what you need to change, get there one piece at a time, but make it a priority because that's going to be like the the lynch point for all other things that orbit around you. And back to the direction that the future is going, basically it, it could go as dark as it wants and difficult for the slaves as uh, it wants, but people who are in this field of health, this healthy vibration in themselves, they're going to find the solutions that they need and they're going to work outside of the system and the system's not going to bother them. It's not going to come and, you know, Waco you and blow up your compound if you're not threatening anybody. That's just not going to happen. Uh, and it's, it's totally the direction we need to go. More cells, freedom cells, if you will. People need to get off their cell phones and start doing what it takes to self-own. And self-ownership is a radical concept in a world where they're starting to tell you that now we can dictate whether or not we put this vaccine in your body. But stand up for your self-ownership and put away the cell phone as much as you can to the degree that it's possible without, you know, re reducing the number of opportunities and synchronicities in your life. But get out of the scroll and get into something whole, holistic. Uh, that's... <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at. And in the future, even if they have this social credit score, if we've localized and decentralized the means of production of things that we need at, to some degree, they're going to have to really, they're going to have to really make martyrs out of us to stop us from doing that. And it will continue waking more people up. And it's just a matter of time. The revolution is not fought with weapons or that type of revolution is just a circle that comes back to where it began revolution. The real changes in consciousness of humanity. And then that also changes government because anyone that's part of any of these organizations, if they have the change of consciousness, then all of a sudden that, that, that thing, either they stop working for it or they start doing something different from the inside. And to a degree, I think we just have to get rid of the concept eventually, but we can work with what we have and, and transition things. And we don't have to like burn down Western civilization to get to a higher level of enlightened society. I do not think we need to burn everything down. I think we need to build things new. And then the things that don't serve anymore will just crumble on their own without having to be forcefully destroyed. And there's a there's a real path forward there, but it requires imagination and it requires fearlessness and knowing that the that fear is the biggest illusion that there is. And really what 
your limits are are your imagination that what you can imagine and that's uh i mean that in itself is something i could spend an hour talking to you and proving to you that the imagination is more real than any other form of thinking that you can do <laughs> but well, like we've been conditioned segue. to believe it's the opposite that it's yeah, fake. I'd like this segue out of one thing that you were talking about which is um in order to achieve the things that you're talking to you're trying you're talking about achieving we're going to need to gather people we are going to need to unite and as you put it wake people up or at least um uh, bring to people's attention in a way that doesn't get immediately discredited as conspiracy which they love to throw that word around anything that somebody doesn't know anything about or doesn't want to be true. No, that's a conspiracy. There's no way that could happen. Having done no research at all. So how do we get the numbers that we need when there's a very small percentage of people that I feel are going to listen to this and be like, yep, I, I, all that. I get it. Yep. We're all on the same page. I think it's a really small outlier percentage of people that see things the way that you see and that I'm starting to be able to see myself um, or at least understand the, the connections that are being made. Um, uh, how do we help people who have never been introduced to something like this or these ideas that everything is connected and we're all controlled and somehow get past, uh, uh, like hearing all of that and don't think, well, God, I guess everything's for naught because everything's controlled and we're just, you know, doom and gloom. Like, how do we, if somebody's listening to this who who agrees with the things that we're talking about and understands what you're saying and wants to, you know, help their the people there in their circles, how do how do we do that? That's one thing I've struggled to figure out is how to guide people into opening their eyes to the possibility that things aren't exactly the way that they appear and not saying there's a big, you know, everything is all controlled. Cause I don't know that, but there's certainly a lot of dots that you can connect that say that it might be. And if it might be, why don't we do some research and let's actually like dispel whether or not it's true rather than dismissing something without really digging into it. Great, great question, man. And so I'll say as far as everything being controlled, there's no like one, there, there's a battle to centralize control. That's what we're seeing develop right now. But there's no one controller. There's still fa there's factions going on behind the scenes trying to take shit over and trying to to control things. But that's not something that is very usually. That's not the best avenue to, as you put it, wake somebody up or give them the red pill out of the matrix. In fact, there's a lot of resistance and cognitive dissonance in that path, and it's it's not it's usually not the way to go. The right person at the right time will be ready for those seeds and we should still call out evil when we see it and plant the seeds of that as well and hope that whenever the conditions are right that those seeds will sprout but for the majority of people the th the factor that's different between you and them is time to some degree and so first we should just trust that well they need more time and that's okay and we should maybe say a prayer that they are able to find a way out of self-destructive mentalities and behaviors uh, early as possible because that's going to be to their benefit but when it comes to the real solution i still maintain that it's health it's getting getting to know yourself heal thyself healthy self those are the same letters those two phrases if you want a healthy self you heal thyself so getting that type of information to people is usually a really strong type of seed to be planting because then they again like if you start looking into well why do i have health problems and what are some of the toxins in the environment and those questions will begin to unravel other parts of the conspiracy cardigan and what i would say to those that dismiss conspiracy theorists is that well are, doesn't it mean you're a coincidence theorist then because there's so many things that you just have think happen to by coincidence to me it's just as a silly of a position to take and that doesn't mean that i think every conspiracy theory is real i can definitely debunk quite a few delusional concepts that float around out there and some of which have been put out there on purpose to discredit other concepts quite a few of them actually but i'd say just the further away from self you get which is also uh, planned <laughs> exactly sorry that's also exactly. also intentional intentionally done yeah 
yeah, it keeps people on a yo-yo, keeps people arguing about, I mean, even like with the 9-11 conspiracy, that's a lot of people's watershed conspiracy realization. A lot of the individuals in that community spend the better part of a decade fighting over, well, did they blow it up like this or did they blow it up like that? And was it the, was it the Jews or was it the Zionists or was it the Vatican or was it George Bush and Dick Cheney? And yeah, they fight, they fight each other over that. And we see this happening with the COVID scare big time. It's an old technique that you can go find in the white papers from these organizations like the Tavistock Institute and the Council on Foreign Relations, where they specifically say things like, OK, what you do is put out information one day through the media that says one thing and then contradict that information the other day. And you do it both under the guise of being science and scientific studies and experts say this. And so then James finds the information on Tuesday and he's like, OK, now I know this. I know that for sure we need to wear a mask because it's the right thing to do and it's safe. And then the next day or the next day, an article comes out that Rachel sees and she's like, oh, well, the New England the New England Journal of Medicine says we do not need to wear a mask and it's pointless and it doesn't protect you at all. And then those two run into each other on someone else's comment th thread on a meme that someone posted on Facebook and they go to war. <laughs> like, and where's that's a lot of energy going into that war, man. Think all this. You could paint a lot of paintings or you could work on your garden a long time in the time that most people are fighting with each other over what they think is right on Facebook. So again, it's about pulling out of the external, going deep internal, going to the self work to the highest degree that you're capable. And then other pieces fall into place and uh, to get people to wake up and switch sides, if you will, to go back to the original question. It's all about what we build. What are you building? What are you creating? What vessel are you pouring your daily thoughts into that actually contains them and holds and stores that energy? Whenever you work a piece of art into being, your thoughts are channeled into a physical object that contains the energy of that. So no matter if you're a master of a certain style of art or you're a novice, if you put 25 hours into the same piece of art and you worked on it consecutively, even if it looks not that good to you still, people are going to have a response to it uh, because the energy that was invested in it is a tangible ex experiential thing. And I mean, I learned, that's how I got into doing art myself is I just was like, okay, I'm gonna just put some time and discipline and effort into things. And I came up with stuff that was pretty cool, even though I have no training and little experience in making art. The same will go for anything that you wanna build in the reality, realize that this quick and easy culture of consumerism is part of the programming that you got to break and realize that especially right now when you have to do a lot on the survival side because you've hurt your health so bad and because you need so much of this debt to pay the debt then maybe you only have 30 minutes in a day to edify yourself or to put energy into a container take that time do a thing do it consistently and you'll find that you get more space the more space you make inside especially with practices like mindfulness that balance the left and right brain hemisphere. Time is what you make of it, literally. So uh, you have exactly the amount of time for things that you decide to allocate to those things and no more, no less. And if you are allocating a lot of that time to something unconscious, then you're not building as much as you could, or maybe you're not really building much at all. So think about what you're building. Even the stuff that seems like it's a, just a vapid waste of your energy is actually building something that is anchoring you to that thing in reality through the habitual behavior, especially when it comes to an addictive dopamine drip type of uh, weaponized technology like social media. And uh, once you have a degree of understanding of how the psychologically something something affects you especially something like social media or how certain symbols like a, to go back to the beginning of the conversation what certain symbols mean on the secret level versus the 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 widely known and publicly conscious level all this stuff builds up a type of psychic immunity to things that would do you harm or would take you off your path so knowledge is like the one true good in the universe. So if there's not something that you really know that you want to put energy into and build as far as a container for something, then put it into knowledge. Just start putting it into knowledge, like find some knowledge and follow that and see where it leads. And, it, you know, <laughs> that's why I make the show I make. I try to, to find knowledge that people might not be aware of and share it with them through a person that I'm interviewing, not unlike what you're doing now. So knowledge is a super powerful thing, but just know that um, when you're on the path to knowledge, you're going to have to go through a lot of uh, crap to get to the diamonds, if you will. And 
Uh, so sometimes that's why a teacher or a guide can be really useful, the right one, not that you should take everything they say as gospel or true or dogma, but that if, if you get to the point through your health that you can feel your own inner feelings and your own inner compass or your conscious, then you are going to have a better realization of whether or not a teacher is good for you either. And so sometimes the right teacher can help accelerate your goal, find some people you resonate with that are making content that's designed and intended to edify you and uh, try to cut out the, the BS, the belief systems as much as you can. Realize that belief is actually the enemy of knowing. A belief is being a lie. Be lie is in belief. And then just be aware of that. Be ready to toss aside old assumptions as soon as new information comes along that seems stronger than the old information and know that it's actually very powerful to be able to say the phrase, I was wrong. It's super powerful because it's like a snake shedding skin and growing to another level of itself. And you have that ability to do that every day by pursuing knowledge. So edify yourself, put the energy of your attention because att energy flows where attention is directed. Put that energy into something that is a container that's for yourself that you can tap back into later or that is literally inside yourself in the form of knowledge or in the form of health. And if that's where you're directing your attention and your energy, you will get a positive feedback loop out of that. Awesome, man. <laughs> <laughs> One thing um, I, I think uh, more on the, on the topic of people getting information and understanding, because again, I, while I appreciate and I understand the things that you're saying, I don't know that um, everyone is on the same page. So one thing I would they recommend <laughs> a lot of pe I would recommend for people to look at um, is a couple of things. So um, there's a, of course, on YouTube, hopefully it's on better formats that aren't uh, nearly as censored, but uh, Yuri Bezmanov, um, he was interviewed. He was a former KGB um, operator. And in 1984, he defected and he came to the U.S. and he was interviewed. And back in the 80s, they were talking about or the Russians knew how to manipulate uh, people by flooding, you know, flooding the all of the media sources with conflicting things to keep people confused. And they lay it out. They they piece by piece, lay out exactly what to do, what is happening now. You can see it happening. You watch his video, the things that he's talking about in 1984, you can see them being used in 2020, like now, this month. Um, separately, Operation Mockingbird, for people who aren't familiar with that, um, is, is another rabbit hole I highly um, suggest people dig really deep into when it comes to uh, manipulating information and how long they've known that they had the ability to do it. And once you see that it was, it was, they were capable of it 20, 30 years ago, maybe it might make more sense how yeah, Project some Mockingbird people believe is that it's happening. The infiltration right. of government agencies like the CIA into mainstream media organizations and outlets right. where this is the gatekeepers I'm talking about. And yeah. You know, there's so much to the way these networks are designed and how they control their own members. And that's another story. Networks of blackmail and what you see with the, the tip of the iceberg and the Epstein scenario represents that. But right. I'll just say for, for people who think they've made it this far and maybe believe that in some way that I would ever support Swamp Thing, the orange man, uh, <laughs> the, the so-called president. So... He is no better than any of the rest of the actors in the highest levels of government. And if he was the real deal and he was really here to save you and drain the swamp and all that, he would have overturned the law that was enacted around the end of World War II, where the government legalized the propagandizing to the public that they've been doing ever since. So what government is, is uh, basically fictional rights being invested into a group of people or individuals that do not have those rights. It's called license. And in nature, if the right to do something doesn't exist for an individual or for, then it doesn't exist for a group and no group can give those rights to an individual. So the fact that the government can give license to a soldier or a cop to kill or give license to a politician to, to lie or give license to media to that they own to, 
to put propaganda out to control and sway the minds of the people. None of those things are real. That's all against natural law. I mean, that's against the laws of nature itself. And so there are ca karmic consequences for that. And that that will be the undoing of the system that we see right now, but it has been designed in such a way that for the most part, the individual people that are cogs in the machine are the ones generating the brunt of the karmic consequences for the behavior. And that's also why you'll never see an order to, from the government to go out and like arrest or murder all the conspiracy researchers at once or something like that, or, or any of them really, because doing that would have a direct karmic blowback on them. But if they can manipulate people's minds in subtle ways to be the enforcers themselves, to be the stormtroopers, to put the mask on, to burn down the public buildings in a riot for over, over rights, uh, then that karmic blowback is on the individual. It's on the person who followed the orders more than it is on the person giving the orders. And if there was no orders given and the person just did it because they've been made insane, then it's even less karmic blowback for the person who manipulated that. So uh, just know that like the, the main tactic of the psychopath is to uh, victimize others while claiming to be the victim. And you see that in so many movements and in so much, so infected into culture right now. And one thing that's worth studying a little bit is just the look into the main tenets of Satanism and try to try to see how and if any of your own personal beliefs or behaviors actually follow the tenets of Satanism. And you'll be surprised that a lot of them may align. And that's something you should be probably concerned about. And one of those tenets is solipsism, which is the belief that truth is completely relative to each person and can be decided based on the whims of the individual. Well, in nature, there is actually such a thing as truth. That which is, that which happened, you know, there's no doubt to mathematical truth, two plus two and all that. So the fact is truth exists. And if someone ever tries to make the point to you, well, uh, truth doesn't exist for any, for whatever argument they make, they just want to say truth does not exist objectively. All you need to ask them is, is that statement true? Because it undoes itself. <laughs> if you follow me, just the very statement, there's no such thing as truth cannot be true. If it is true, it's paradox. So I, ag so I agree with that i would also say that every person is living a different reality there's perspectives that, on truth yes right, and right, there's right. preferences too exactly yeah. so different people are, are 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 living a different reality for instance with covid how some people never really stopped going to work so they were basically put into this really you know, um, intense situation where they're really flooded with fear while other people were at home, not sure what's happening on the outside. And so for, for different people, this pandemic is a completely different thing, depending on what reality you're living and how it's affecting your reality. So I just want to make that, that small differentiation that it doesn't mean that two people can't experience two different things and have two different understandings of what something is, but also there are such things as truth. There is this and like things exist. <laughs> yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's an important caveat to make for sure. We all have a different perspective on truth. That's what gives us individuality, uniqueness. Uniqueness is your greatest gift in this life and finding and expressing your uniqueness is actually that which the world needs most out of you. But if two of us are pointing our fingers at the moon, the fingers aren't the moon. The hands look different, but they're pointing to the same thing. And that thing is in nature and it exists. And there is no lie in nature. And that's a really important maxim to keep in mind if you're ever approaching something regarding your health. Well, how close and aligned to nature is this thing? Before I put it in my body, let's ask that question. And w would nature be able to get that into my body without a bunch of artifici uh, artificial, ar artificiality? <laughs> uh, but that's a that's a good foundational maxim to hold on to. But you know, don't take that notion that truth exists objectively and independent of you to mean that everything that you believe is true because then you're just into solipsism again. You right. need to be open to the fact that the things that you currently hold and think you know to be true could be wrong, could be, but you should hold fast to what you know to be true until you have a reason that being honest with yourself would require that you no longer 
thought that you knew that. So uh, it's it's definitely an age where standing up for and speaking the truth is less popular than ever. And you can definitely take that as a measure of illness in the psychological state of the society. But we're there. We're at the point where there's definitely some fires burning for for the truth and for goodness. And you know, if you throw out truth for the for moral relativism and cultural relativism, it's not a slippery slope to start saying things like, well, if uh, all the other sexual orientations are allowed, then pedophilia should be tolerant too. It's just, we only think that it's not okay because our culture has told us it's bad. So cultural relativism in other cultures, they do it and they don't think it's bad. So it's probably not bad, right? Wrong. It's never right to force a child to do something that they're not naturally ready to express themselves. So yeah, that's uh, an that's interesting philosophy, philosophy rabbit hole to get into. Um, one of a, a good friend of mine is a philosophy professor. And we talked about that kind of thing, how there are countries where it is tradition to rape women. That's a, that's a rite of passage. Um, there's one where I think it was, they had to like, sacrifice their genitalia like there's some weird things that are cultural in in certain parts of the world that to us seem so ridiculously important and of course i'm not advocating for any of these things or for children that uh, i personally Dude, how many people do you know that didn't have the tip of their dick cut off yeah i do exactly how many people you know that didn't have that done to them did you do, do we get to choose that that's like that tells you everything you need to know about the what type of a system that we live under and that people actually believe that just because other people say it's a good idea, it must be okay. What you're saying when you do that is like, okay, here's God's creation or nature's creation. It's imperfect. So we have to fix it by cutting off the tip of this baby's dick before they even get a choice to ask if that's okay. Are you kidding me? I mean, this is something that gets me pretty fired up. People should think about this. I mean, you're traumatizing babies in maiming them in a way that they'll never be the same as they would be if they were whole in that sense. But I don't want to say all that to scare people because the body is amazingly adaptable. And once you get into the real mechanism by which your body heals and becomes whole and really, really connect to that, you find that that's the universal consciousness of source itself that's causing this fun, this magical thing process of healing where a scratch on your arm in a few days is just a thin red line and then a few weeks later it's nothing where how is that happening it's an automatic process and it's a, a flow of energy inside you that leads to that process so it is about improving your current and your personal energy levels and there's a lot of ways there's a lot of cool ways that i can talk about things you can do to do that but speaking of energy currents and levels i'm kind of on a wind down phase of my circadian rhythm and if yeah, it's okay absolutely. with you. Absolutely. I was just going to say, I was just going to say, if you want to um, let everybody know about the Interverse podcast, like where can they listen to it? If they want to hear more about these types of topics, um, what, where can they find, find you or contact you? Maybe they have questions and want to engage. <laughs> sure, man. I'm definitely down to pick this up. Uh, you know, I'm sure there'll be things that come up that you'll think about that you would want to go into in a future conversation. Oh, dude, I've got a whole list. We only, we only yeah. went over like two of them. So we'll definitely yeah. be doing this again. Cool, man. I love it because although, I mean, I want to let people know about my podcast. I think it's great. There's not really me just going off like this on that show. <laughs> oh, okay. I think I need more of that, but I try to bring like, um, you'll see that I'm pretty mild mannered on my own show and I pretty much try to give, the guest as much room to do whatever verbal jujitsu they've got in mind as possible. Right, exactly. Like you've graciously done for me here. So I think that that's a, I think that's what makes the show cool is that there's a huge variety of ideas and topics that we go into the pillars of the show. In my opinion, are consciousness, creativity, spiritual development, health, and conspiracy, not conspiracy theory, conspiracy, realism, <laughs> and conspiracy even has a lot of words. It means together in the breath breathing together, con, with, inspire, spirit. So conspiracy in a positive sense, I'm starting a conspiracy of like-minded truth seekers, if you will. <laughs> People that actually use that modulating point of the breath as the thing to anchor in the source energy. And that's really as simple as it can be is the breath. That's uh, something to pursue as far as your health. So there's a lot of really useful information on the show. Uh, I've got 
over 150, probably like 170 episodes. They're all an hour for free. And the second hour you can get on Patreon by giving me $5 a month, which is pretty meager and helps me pay for like the software I use and things like that. So definitely could use the support. And, you know, if you do join the uh, Discord, you get a little bit more of me and my thoughts and you can ask me questions or I can ask you questions. And I just want to put all of the pieces of the puzzle together that we all have and see what kind of wholeness we can achieve by coming together and just getting rid of this whole division paradigm entirely. And I know that it's there. The solutions are all there. They're all in imagination waiting to be discovered by us. And yeah, imagination is the biggest part of Innerverse itself. It's your inner song the verse like it's what it's what's coming out of you in a flow state it's it's what your uniqueness is here to to share and spread to the world so i'd love it if people came and checked it out it's interversepodcast.com is the website from there you can find the links to it on everything youtube and spotify and itunes and the like so be great to have you and uh thanks for giving me the chance to talk in this has been really cool i had a great time felt like i definitely engaged the flow state <laughs> I tuned myself up proper before yeah, this sure. co conversation. Uh, one thing I'm really into right now is biofield tuning with tuning forks. And man, there's some yeah, kind I'm of... Yeah, I'm bummed we didn't get to that yet, but I'm excited to talk about it um, in the next one, man. It's on my list. I, ha I have it written down. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see your journey in that, man. I love the idea of starting something new and pushing through until you're proficient at it, which is what I'm doing with this podcast. Uh, yeah, that's what you got to do, bro. Yeah, man. I just still pour feel your like I'm only just it. figuring it out. <laughs> oh, I don't think years. you ever stop figuring it out, man. Yeah. But well, anyway, man, thank you so much for coming on, dude. I had a great time. Um, I look forward to the next one. And uh, there's a quote that I like to use that really ties in with this, which is from Josh Holm, the lead singer of Queens of the Stone Age. And his philosophy is to leave space in yourself to be surprised by this reality that we live in just be open to the idea that something might surprise you and I, that really resonates with me coming from a, a path where i was absolutely surprised uh, at every turn when i started seeing things that i didn't pay attention to before and so if there's any piece of advice or any nugget of wisdom that i can bestow upon anyone it is to try to approach everything with the possibility of coming out of it surprised to learn something that you didn't know before. That's great because <laughs> it fits in really well with what I wanted to share in this uh, edition here, which are a couple of books that I think could really surprise people in a good way and plant seeds that once start to take root will never you'll never be able to see things the same way. So I did talk about earlier symbolic literacy a little bit, and that's a really important skill set for our age. I am lucky to have found my way through an English major in college in creative writing as an emphasis area and film studies as a minor. So I actually got for <laughs> some people get kind of shitty right into the deal with college, but I wound up with uh, something useful that's benefited me later, which is the a uh, practice of analyzing things on a symbolic level. And when you start analyzing the world on a symbolic level, you find out, oh, wow, this is even more useful to understanding where I'm at than doing this to my to dreams, <laughs> analyzing things. So uh, there's a couple of books to recommend. One is called, and I'll link you these if you're able to put them in the show notes. I think that'd be cool. I have no like sure. affiliation with these books that is going to benefit me other than I believe that the knowledge is ready to come out. But uh, the first one's called Spirit World, but instead of world, it's world like spun, W-H-I-R-L-E-D. And it's a three book series. And the first one's called The Deaf Phoenicians. And Phoenicians are where we get the idea of phonetics from and a lot of other ideas. But being a deaf Phoenician is something that this book talks about, which is a person who is deaf to the innate alternative meanings of words and how those words are used on us psychologically in a way that influences us beyond our understanding. And not just the words uh, themselves, but also the deeper symbols that are the core anchoring archetypes in human consciousness represented by the pantheon of gods or the planets and the journey of the sun through the zodiac. That's a lot of what the book is about. It's what you would call syncretism, 
where you take the wisdom from multiple spiritual traditions and synthesize it into one story that makes sense of all of them as opposed to each one being kind of mysterious and i wouldn't claim that this book spirit world the definitions is the end all be all like it should be your bible and believe every word in it i'm just saying if you read it you won't be able to unsee what you see in the language and in the spiritual traditions of the world and it will make a big difference in your life to have the information but it's also responsibility once you the deeper levels of truth you gain the more karma is going to be on you for not helping other people see truth so uh, it's why, like in some <laughs> Buddhist traditions, they say, if you're not ready to go all the way, then don't even start on the spiritual path. You, It's not for you if it, you have to be ready to go all the way. But I think humanity's got to go all the way. Actually, it's Buddha. There's a Buddha quote that says that there's two mistakes on the path to truth, not starting and not going all the way. And the other one I'd recommend, although I think it's a little less um, easy to follow, I think the Spirit World book is more concise. No no less love to the other author, but there's a book called The Code to the Matrix, which you can get for free by James Evan Bomar or Seven Bomar, which I'll link that one to you as well. He put that one out for free when he wrote it. It's a similar type of information, but uh, I think that I would point people to Spirit World more because it kind of takes information from Code to the Matrix and other things and synthesizes them. Um, but Mentioning that author, James Evan Bomar, also goes by Seven. He has a website called Secret Energy, and secretenergy.com is a really great source for both metaphysical and spiritual information and a good community of people who are sincere, like spiritual people, good people. It's also got a cool store with a lot of different supplements that are more on the holistic um, Eastern Chinese medicine type things and a really useful section of cleansing kits and you can get cleanse kits from other websites or whatever but internal organ cleansing you can learn the process from the secret energy website and trust uh that like i've done the process off of that kit and benefited from it and it's safe bye everybody